All right, I've made it to the installation site. All the pieces are done. It's time to assemble. So the repeating cell in the weave is like so. You have a hexagon and a pattern of over, under, over, under. So to help me, I've done this whole pattern. And as you can see, there are certain cells. Um, I've colored it in three colors yellow, green, and red. So my thought is to fabricate the lattice, I'll make a bunch of these cells and then come back and do the, the corner cases and the edge cases later. First I put together a frame that I built to serve as a scaffolding to support the work during assembly. And then I start building these cells one by one. Each cell has 12 pieces arranged around a central hexagon and the cells will join up to form the core of the lattice. Each cell is identical in terms of the weave of it, how the slats are arranged over and under and in between each other. Now that I've got all 10 cells done, I start combining them into pairs of cells. So there's one pair. You can see that the edges are still loose and frayed. Because a joint's not complete until all the elements around it are present, this is the most I can fasten for now. I hang each of these chunks at their approximate locations and stagger them to where they'll be able to link up easily. To get everything tidy, I'll take the joints on the hinges and put a pin through them temporarily. And then I'll keep working with these temporary pins to link everything together. It's a little rough, but the weave is right. I think that's a good place to stop for the day. It's now day two. Time to get to work. So with the core done, I'm left now with the perimeter, which is somewhat more tricky to put together with the right weave. In the core, you can easily reference the existing pattern of neighboring pieces to pick up the pattern of over, under, over, under. But in the edge, you just have to extrapolate from one direction. Each of the joints goes together with a machine screw and a nut. But where I want a temporary pin, I just use a machine screw by itself. The lattice pieces remind me of an erector set, which I never got a chance to play with growing up, but this makes up for it. There's something special about taking a lot of small, simple pieces and putting them together in an organized way and ending up with something big with important properties of its own that you don't get from any of the individual pieces themselves. And it's cool to think that this whole lattice can be transported in something the size of a shoebox, if it's ever disassembled again anyways. It took me a while to really get a feel for the weave pattern and to go and extend it as I was working around the perimeter. Like many things in life, by the time I start to really get good at it, I reach the end. Now that all the pieces of the lattice are in place, I can go and fix most of the joints using a screw, nut, and washer set. I'll leave each one only finger tight for now, and then once the entire sculpture is assembled, I'll come back with a screwdriver and fully tighten each of the joints. Next, I'll adjust how it hangs. I'd like to get it level and at just the right height. When the time comes to mount the sculpture, the scaffolding will be holding it at just the right height so that it can attach to the wall without requiring any shifting. I'm using a trucker's hitch for each line, which is super handy for being able to adjust and then tie off in place. Now that I've got it in its final position, I'd like to transition to a different way of suspending it, one that supports the entire weight uniformly. So I'm using a new line to run a kind of lacing along the top rail and passing through each joint on the top of each of the columns of the lattice. And what it does is allow the tension to equalize across its entire length. Now I can remove the five lines from before and the entire thing will be suspended only on the lacing. This way, hopefully all the links will settle nicely into place, and I'll end up with a lattice in the end without any kinks or distortions. And now the lattice is ready to receive the pivoting rods. First the lower support block gets attached. It's the same way the other joints in the lattice go together, except with a longer machine screw to accommodate the block. Then the upper support block gets attached, but only loosely. Each rod has one end which is rounded smooth, so I make sure to place that end down so that it can pivot with less friction. 
The rods are just the right length such that they're restrained between the two support blocks once the blocks are tightened. That way the rods can move freely but can't be undone and can't pop out. The rods and the blocks need to go on at the same time because each block will hold two rod ends, one from the bottom and one from the top. So I'm going sequentially and working my way from the bottom up. As I go, the lattice is becoming more rigid as well because everywhere that I attach a block, I'm also fastening a joint of the lattice. A lot of pieces here are serving double duty or even triple duty like this. And I guess that comes from a desire to make the sculpture more minimalistic. Whew. It's all assembled. Next I'm going to go through and tighten all the nuts and bolts to fully fasten the lattice together. I'm able to get away with just a screwdriver to tighten everything because the nut in the back, once it's finger tight, bites into the wood just enough to keep from spinning around. And I'm using a special procedure when I tighten the screws that hold the support blocks in place. I've got a pair of straight edges that I squeeze together around a pair of blocks to shift them into alignment so that when I crank the screws down, the slots will be collinear with the axle and hopefully they won't rub. Okay. All the screws are tightened. Yeah, much stiffer now. Now that all the joints on the lattice are tight, I can treat it as one rigid piece. So now the lacing suspension from above has served its purpose. So now I'm using these mounting plates to attach the sculpture more rigidly to the scaffolding, and it'll be more secure that way. That's everything for today. Tomorrow's the day of truth. I'm a little nervous. Can you imagine standing before this thing, taking hold of one of the rods, moving it, and watching the movement travel throughout the whole array? It's day three. Time to get to work on the springs. This is the full collection of springs formed by hand. Each one has hooks on the ends, so they're ready to make connections. But it turns out there was a fair bit of variation in the lengths between the springs. So I decided not to ignore this variation, but to work with it somehow. So I went through and measured each spring and sorted them by length. Okay, so the springs range in length from between 45 and 60 centimeters. So I think what I'm going to do is arrange them symmetrically. So I'll put the longest ones in the center, and then they'll get shorter going outwards, and then the shortest ones will be on the perimeter. My thinking is that you want shorter and therefore tighter springs around the outside, because those elements don't have as many neighbors being on the edge. So they don't get pulled as hard, so therefore a tighter spring arrangement could make up for it. Whereas the ones in the center, they have a maximum amount of neighbors surrounded on all six sides, and so they're going to be subject to more spring pulling forces and so a looser spring would help make up for that. First sample. Got three rods connected. They're behaving nicely. I think the improvement in the shaft bearings made a, a difference. Promising start. When fabricating the springs, my idea was to use a fixed number of coils. So each spring was cut to be 15 coils long. But the coil spacing didn't end up being so consistent from batch to batch. So the result is that they're not all quite the same length. And whether or not my idea to use shorter springs on the outside and longer springs on the inside will make a difference, what I am certain of is that you want balanced pairs of springs between the front side and the back side. For example, for a pair of elements connected by a pair of springs, if the spring on the front side is tighter than the one on the back side, then the elements are going to nose together on the front when they come to rest, and they're going to spread apart on the back side when they come to rest. So at the very least, I'll have matching lengths. I'll match up pairs of 60 millimeter springs on the front with 60s on the back, 55s, 50, 45s, etc., all matching. So now I've completed the perimeter, and I've completed the very center, and what's left are the majority of springs, which are all pretty consistent in the intermediate length. And these ones make up the bulk of the connections. I find it immensely satisfying working on a piece like this with repeated elements. Take 
an interesting component and repeat it throughout an entire space, the collective behavior you get can really be wonderful. That's it, the sculpture is assembled. <laughs> it's been a satisfying three days. I think it came out well. I'm proud of it. I will be back in a few days when the time comes to hang it on the wall. <laughs>